Hello, everyone. I'm Kat Oriel with Forbes Breaking News. Today, I'm here with Dr. Chad Hansen, a California wildfire scientist and a forest and fire ecologist with the John Muir Project. He's also authored books about this topic as well. So thank you so much for joining me today. Happy to do so. Well, so let's get started with a very big um fire going on in Cal Southern California right now. I know Southern California is facing a bout of a few uncontrolled wildfires. So the biggest one right now is the Lion Fire in San Bernardino County. Can you talk about the reports you're seeing about this fire? And do we know exactly what caused this? Well, the, the cause is unknown at this point, as far as, uh, as, as, far as I'm aware. Um, I suspect it's a human cause, mm -hmm. uh, probably an accidental ignition just because of where it started. It started uh, in low elevation uh, at the edge of a community and then spread up slope into the into the mountains. Um, typically, those are human ignitions. But um, right now, it's uh, it's over 20,000 acres. Um, it's burning between Highland and Running Springs um, and then spreading eastward towards uh, the little community of Angeles Oaks. And, uh, you know, so, you know, it's spreading through some pretty remote country and very steep country uh, in hot, dry, windy conditions. And that's really the main factor is the, the, the weather and the climate. Right. That's interesting that you mentioned about the potential human cause of this. I'm wondering if you have a little bit of a breakdown. You know, of course, climate only exacerbates this, but do you have a breakdown of like how often it started just, you know, um, completely natural causes or um, a human potentially causing it? Absolutely. So there's been a lot of work done on this. And depending on the study, the figures vary a little bit, um, depending on how they look at it. But basically, when you're talking about lower elevation ignitions uh, that are close to communities, the great majority of those are human caused, um, over 90%, sometimes over 95%. When you're further into the mountains at the higher elevations, most of those ignitions um, in, uh, in the West are lightning causes. So basically natural lightning strikes. Now there are some, you know, accidental um, or sometimes arson human ignitions at, in the mountains too, but usually it's lightning in the, the, the larger fires in the mm -hmm. mountains. So it really just depends where the fire started. Right. Well, speaking of lightning, I think one of the most interesting things that I saw when I was researching this fire is that they were saying that smoke from the fire has created clouds similar to those that come from thunderstorms, prompting reports of almost um, 1,100 lightning strikes in the area. So I'm just reading that and thinking to myself, is this normal? Is this a new normal? Is this something that you often see in wildfires? Yeah, you do. You do. It's, uh, it's a common uh, a feature of wildfires. Smoke uh, has an effect on fire. It can actually have a dampening effect on the fire activity. And if the smoke kind of gets blown out by the wind, um, then you've got, uh, you know, warmer, sunnier conditions and that, that can spread the fire faster. So you have a lot of feedback loops in these fires. Um, it can influence all kinds of things. And yeah, there have been a lot of lightning strikes, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, kind of an X factor here, of course, you know, you can have new ignitions happening with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I do also want to speak to climate change, of course, you know, that often tends to be the root causes of natural disasters like this. And so I'm just curious how you've seen climate change lead to an increase in the frequency and strength of wildfires and just how dire the situation is now in 2024. It's pretty serious. You know, climate change is uh, is a huge, huge influence on wildfires. You know, wildfires are natural um, and they're they're not a bad thing in, in ecosystems, whether it's, you know, sh uh, chaparral or forests, you can have too much fire or too little fire. We have too much in chaparral right now. We have too little in most forest ecosystems, but it's natural, it's not a bad thing. The difference is, is that with climate change, we are in a position where in certain areas, we may get too much fire. That's already happening in Southern California in most of the chaparral ecosystems. Um, we still don't have an excess in forests, but as temperatures climb with more human activities, uh, fossil fuel consumption, and also logging, which is a huge source of carbon emissions, that drives temperatures higher because of the higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And that can have a huge effect on wildfires because hotter temperatures drive bigger, uh, more intense, wild, more, bigger wildfires, and uh, they tend to spread faster. Um, so, um, 
you know, these things are all interrelated, but this is the key factor is that this, these are really climate events. These are weather events. And we need to understand that and focus our efforts on protecting communities mm -hmm. and, and focus our efforts directly there rather than trying to stop fires in the wildlands on hot, dry, windy days, because you really can't do that. Mm -hmm. That being said, how effective do you find California, um, their responsibility in general when it comes to preventing and then managing massive wildfires such as this one? Well, you know, at the state level in California and the federal level, um, right now, uh, it's good news, bad news situation. You know, we're in, right now, we're doing things in mostly the wrong ways that mm -hmm. are not effective and are even counterproductive. So the current uh, approach is to focus on uh, vegetation management, removing vegetation in the wildland. It's removing trees, removing shrubs and thinking that's gonna act as a fire break and it's gonna stop the fires. Um, and then when fires occur, most of the money, most of the effort is on trying to stop the fire in the wildlands as it's spreading uh, across the landscape driven by winds. Um, and that really isn't possible. The problem is removing vegetation actually makes fires spread faster. Um, the denser the vegetation, the slower the fires spread. Um, and uh, that's, it, it seems counterintuitive, but that's the way it works. Um, denser forests, for example, have a cool, moist, shady microclimate. And um, when you remove trees, you undermine that. And so what basically we're spending money in, in ways that are actually making fires spread faster uh, toward communities, um, in ways that are actually increasing carbon emissions, um, because we're pulling carbon out of our carbon sinks. And uh, what we should be doing is focusing on protecting communities directly through proven measures like home hardening and defensible space pruning, basically things that make the home and the immediate surroundings more fire safe. I'm just curious if you think that the federal agencies, the state agencies like the U.S. Forest Service, you know, are they aware that the prevention efforts are actually contributing to the spread of wildfires? Because, you know, the research is there. You've um, dedicated a lot of time to this. So are they aware of this? And if they are, why are they still um, operating in this way? <laughs> well, you, you've asked the key question right there. Uh, yes, they're aware. Um, and interestingly, you know, hundreds of independent scientists uh, like myself um, have, have sent the Forest Service uh, letters, notices, have sent letters, notices to Congress, to the administration, letting them know what the science is saying. And many of these studies are actually being published by Forest Service scientists mm -hmm. these days. And so they, they know that their, their own science is actually contradicting what they're doing. Um, they also have a core group of scientists that are sort of maintaining the party line. So there's a, mm -hmm. there's a conflict even within the Forest mm -hmm. Service about this. But where the great majority of the best science, the most comprehensive science is pointing, is that these are weather and climate events, and we're making things worse by pulling trees and, and, and other vegetation out of wildlands and undermining our carbon sinks. And what we need to do is really just focus on protecting communities through the, the things that we know from the science are extremely effective. Um, home hardening, making homes more fire safe, and providing assistance to do that, defensible space pruning within about 100 feet around homes, um, and then evacuation assistance when there's a fire. Are there any states you can think of that are doing a very good job of doing this? <laughs> no, uh, there are no <laughs> states that are doing a good job on this right now. So this is why I say it's a good news, bad news situation. Bad news is, is, that, um, is that we're doing things wrong, mostly right now. The good news is, is that we are starting to shift slowly, incrementally in the right direction. So if you look at like the, the, um, the daily reports on the line fire and all, all, all the other fires that are going on right now, what you'll see is mentions about uh, what they call you know, uh, structure defense or community defense activities. And so a lot of the firefighters you know, are, are actually working to do that defensible space in, in advance of the approaching flames. Um, they're helping people and their animals evacuate. They're doing the things that, that, that we should be doing. The, the, the thing is, is that um, that's great and that really is important, but we need to be doing that well in advance mm -hmm. of these fires before the fires start, before fire season starts. So this needs to be a shift in policy, not just a shift in, mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in, in firefighting tactics when the fire actually happens. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know you also mentioned that as well when it comes to fighting the fires when they're actually happen, happening, the ways in which that can be happening sometimes are also wrong. So do you see, can you speak to those strategies a little bit? And do you see those strategies being implemented right now during the line fire? 
Um, yeah, yeah, they they are. I mean, it's and we see this line fire is not unique in this, but um, you know, most of the of the money, most of the effort is on uh, you know, bulldozers um out in the wildlands, you know, trying to you know create long, long bulldozer lines that they think will might will stop the fire, you know, from spreading. Um uh giant air tankers, you know, dropping water and fire retardant out in the wildlands. And um, the thing is, you can't stop a, a weather driven fire that way. You know, when you've got hot, dry, windy conditions, um, the fire is going to move. And most a lot of what happens when the fire moves is it's it's throwing up embers and the embers are driven by the winds and it's leapfrogging over the fire line. And so it'll just go over any of those bulldozer lines. It doesn't matter. I mean, it'll, it'll, they'll, they'll go two, three miles sometimes, um, the embers. And so uh, when you have hot, dry, windy conditions, um, you're really, you know, you're trying to fight the wind and you can't fight the wind. You know, you can't fight it with a bulldozer. You can't fight it with a chainsaw and you can't fight it with an air tanker. And so that's why I say that um, those are tactics that um, that are just not, especially in the era of the climate crisis, mm -hmm. those are tactics that are just not effective, mm -hmm. not anymore anyway. And so we need to focus on the thing that we know is effective and will continue to be effective, which is direct protection of communities, mm -hmm. people, yeah. their animals, and uh, their homes. I know you mentioned policy a little bit when it comes to this. So what would you like to see actually done more on a federal level when it comes to either from Congress or the White House? What do you think that they can actually do to address this issue? Yeah, so um, you know, we need new legislation. We need legislation to protect our carbon sinks. For example, on our national forests, we still have a commercial logging program based on you know many many decades old statutes that just don't have a place anymore in a 21st century world. We need to protect our national forests, get the U.S. Forest Service out of the logging business, and keep the carbon in our forests. That's one key thing, and that would that would help shift away from that kind of backcountry approach and shift our focus toward communities. The second thing is basically take the billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer money that we're currently spending inappropriately on backcountry logging and other backcountry activities and focus them on home hardening, uh, defensible space, community protection work that will actually save homes and lives. Well, that's the end of my questions. You, is there anything else you would like to add that you think people should know when it comes to the line fire or wildfires in general? Well, I would just kind of expand a little bit on your last question and just say mm -hmm. that we have, you know, a number of um, of bills introduced in Congress, and it's not just any one. I mean, we see them again and again, um, and oftentimes by people who, you know, care about these issues, or at least say they do, you know, so like, I think their intentions are good. Um, but, uh, you know, typically we'll see $30 billion proposed for backcountry logging and, and, uh, and, and vegetation removal and like $3 billion for community protection uh, through home hardening defensible space. That's exactly the, the, the mm -hmm. wrong approach. You know, it should be $30 billion for home hardening defensible mm -hmm. space. And, um, and basically, you know, we shouldn't be allocating money for backcountry logging. That's the wrong thing to do. So I think we just need to shift our priorities. You know, we need to pay attention to the current science. And, you know, right now we were talking about, you know, the, the Forest Service and, and how they're, you know, they're kind of clinging to these old policies. But the reason they're clinging to those old policies is because of the laws on the books that, that Congress needs to change. Those laws allow the Forest Service to sell trees from public lands to private logging companies and keep the revenue for their budget. So that's an incentive we no longer can, can afford. Right. Well, thank you so much for explaining that all for me and breaking it down. My pleasure.